Welcome into another quarantine edition of Five Rings Canes here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Happy to keep providing content through these just weird times, man, during this COVID-19 epidemic. I'm Alex Dono, joined as always by our boy Blue, the man, the myth, the legend, Larry Bluestein. Blue, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Uh, had an opportunity to kind of reach out to uh, the University of Miami coaches, Manny Diaz and a couple of others during this uh, uh, hiatus that we're on just to see how they were doing <clears throat> and seeing what's going on. And all of them uh, seem to be, you know, working hard from home, making offers still. Um, uh, crazy, you know, how people keep asking me, how, how do these guys make any extending these offers to these kids uh that a lot of them haven't seen in a while but uh, you know you have to keep up with the joneses and certainly they they have and uh, and it seems like they're all doing well i mean you know they communicate every single day they're on you know they're on um you know they're on their meetings uh, offense with offense defense with defense and then manny has a uh, meeting with everybody uh at the end of the hour to see how everybody's going talk about recruiting so Hey, listen, you know what? You could do what you can only do. And uh, certainly they're they're trying as hard as they can uh, under the restraints right now. Has anyone expressed any concern to you that, you know, the season may not start on time or that they may be playing in empty stadiums or anything like that? Huh. No, not uh, – well, <clears throat> you know, you and I, we discussed that last week a little bit with Brian uh, Monroe about what uh, Kirk Herbstreet said about uh, he didn't think that the season was going to be played. But I, I just think that people are taking it one day at a time. Uh, you know, I, I think if they look too far ahead, it gets them upset. You know, yeah. so yeah. so they're just, um, you know, and I pose that question and they go, no, we're recruiting as if, you know, we're uh, and we're, we're going about things, game planning, taking a look at each game uh, just like we were going to play it. I don't think uh, I don't think they're looking, you know, past that there. You know, Alex, I don't have to tell you <clears> – <throat> everybody's a little upset by now, you know, they're, they're, you know, how, how things are and they know that they're out of their control and that they're not the only ones going through it. You know, like when we used to go through hurricanes and it put Miami and maybe FIU and a few other schools in South Florida in, in a tough, uh, tough way, but everybody's under this structure. So it's not, it's not that uh, we're, you know, we're going through it alone. Everybody else is under the same playing by the same rules right now. So with most of us, you know, being essentially stuck at home in quarantine and isolation, everybody's looking for content, right? Whether you're binge watching everything on Netflix and running out of Netflix shows or you know, the sports fans out there, you're you know, going through YouTube and anywhere you can find old videos and games. Uh, if you're a Miami Hurricanes fan, there's a really, really rich history of amazing games and amazing moments. And if you're you know, a younger fan, maybe you're in your 20s or you're in your teens, there's probably a lot of great history that you've missed out on and I think our, our special guest today has done an unbelievable job uh, going through some of these great games and great memories uh, you know him of course we had him on this show a few weeks ago uh, he is a staple at five reasons and he is the author of the recollected dozen series where he's gone through 12 incredible games in University of Miami football history and he even went the extra mile and and put out like 10 honorable mentions and summarized those games as well so it's like a dozen plus like another 10 11 games Vishnu Parasuraman joins us so Vishnu and I know you're you're working as well you're finding a time to pump out a lot of stories you, you seem to be more productive with your time than a lot of us out there how are you? Yeah, I don't know about that. I think it's just it's it's how I chose to waste my time was to write about old Canes games. Uh, everyone's got their own thing they're doing to cope. Now, something that I really appreciate, and if you go to FiveReasonsSports.com or if you go to uh, Vishner's Twitter account, you'll you'll see you know the uh, the story uh, at the top of his uh, at the top of his timeline. So you can click on the link. Uh, I really appreciate the way that you laid this out, Vishnu, because I think it would have been very easy if you're coming up with 12 great games in Miami history to really focus on Florida State games, maybe a handful of Florida games, national championship games. You actually eliminated that from your criteria because you wanted to dig a little bit deeper. You actually wanted to you know, pluck out some games that folks may be a little bit less likely to remember. Kind of tell me about that process and how you decided – 
not to take the easy way out with, you know, all the wide right games and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I actually didn't really consider going the games everyone knows about. I don't think that's as interesting. I did um, had kind of three things I wanted to, to go through, uh, or, or I proposed going through. One was kind of recapping the five championship seasons. Uh, the second option was doing um, five seasons that should have been championships that for whatever reason <laughs> didn't end up in it. There's actually more than five if you go yeah. back to the history, which I did discover as part of doing this. Um, and then the third option was what we ended up doing, which was kind of forgotten games. I said games, but it was really wins. Who wants to uh, <laughs> go back over losses? Um, and so we did a fan vote on Twitter and, and the, the forgotten games won. So it went that direction. So yeah, yeah. I did eliminate any Florida, Florida State, Virginia Tech, Notre Dame just right off the bat. Because to me, those are always, those are the rivals. And, and those games aren't ever really forgotten. And this was yeah. educational for me. I mean, here are just for reference the 12 <laughs> games that Vishnu went with. And, and these are all bangers, of course, and maybe some you might remember more than others. Uh, 2013, Wake Forest at Miami. 1997, Miami at Boston College. There are certainly a few great Boston College games in memory, uh, 2004, Miami at Virginia, 2012, Miami at Georgia Tech, 2009, Miami at Wake Forest, a lot of road games on this list, uh, 2008, Miami at Virginia, 1991, Miami at Boston College, 2012, NC State at Miami, 2004 Louisville at Miami that's honestly one of my favorites ever you know Devin Hester on that on that return uh 2005 Miami at Clemson 1998 Miami at Michigan 1999 Miami at Boston College so Vishnu how many of uh how many of these games and I know you mentioned in in your story that you have a little bit of a recency bias like from Seems like uh, the early 90s on, and I'm right there with you. It's why we've got Larry Bluestein, who remembers games like before he was even born somehow. <laughs> but uh, any of these games that you went with, maybe you didn't remember a whole lot about, and you really had to dig deep with your own research. Yeah, certainly the, the 88 Michigan game, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't even living in Miami at the time, so that one was just completely – like the process was I started with the 83 season because I – <laughs> just felt, felt like a good place to cut off the first championship year yeah. and kind of went through essentially season schedules to figure out what games were competitive, then drilled into them to see like, how did it get there? And that's where the list came out of. So some of them, obviously the more recent ones I actually remember the game. So those were easier, but something like that I'd heard about. So just that, that game in particular is one where the Canes were down by 16 points with like five minutes left and scored 17 points in one. Um, right. And I knew there was a big comeback, but I didn't really know the context. I hadn't seen it. Um, a lot of these games, and I don't know who had the time to go do this, people have actually <laughs> gone through and like cut out everything but the plays. So you can watch like a 40, 30 to 40 minute YouTube clip of the whole game because it's just every wow. snap and every play. Um, so that's how I ingested that game. <laughs> well, so I, I remember that, that 19 game. yeah go ahead that, that 1988 Michigan game now obviously that was I mean that was crazy I remember Steve Walsh in that game and I mean it was like you said it was Walsh was even though he threw two picks I think he threw for over 300 yards in the game um he kept them in there I remember Dale Dawkins who came out of Vero Beach had a huge game <clears throat> excuse me and obviously Carlos Huerta if uh, one of the kickers who a lot of people think is one of the best Miami's ever had, uh, had a huge uh, role in that game with an onside kick. Um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of remember that like it was, uh, it was yesterday. It was, uh, that, that was really in, in those Wake Forest games that you mentioned. I remember the one with, uh, I guess, was a 2013 game or 12 when Duke Johnson had a big game in that game. And he, um, now how did you, now you picked these basically just, uh, from from the uh, from the uh, uh, response of the fans, uh, did you have any favorites that you said, you know what, I want to go back and do this? Did you did you guys have any that you <clears throat> did just because you wanted to do them? Oh, they were all just based on what I wanted to do. The oh, okay. the, the fans <laughs> picked the topic, 
I oh, okay. went, 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 it, went it alone on picking them. But you called out a good – so some of them – so because it was my opinion, I got to pick exactly why I put a game in a certain place. I definitely wanted to make sure there – you called out Duke Johnson, that there was right. a Duke Johnson game in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that definitely leaned me in that direction because he had so many great games that are frankly lost to time now because those Al Golden teams were just bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's it's unfortunate because there were some great players on those teams, and he's one of them. Um, the 2005 Clemson game was kind of the last gasp of the Larry Coker era of that season because the next year, six wins. And, and I got to tell you on that on that note, uh, the Miami at Clemson game. Yeah, you know, I I know a couple of guys who were on that team in 2005, and anytime you ask these guys about great games they were a part of that one's always at the tip of the tongue, right? Like, I mean, we, we just, uh, Blue and I had Brian Monroe on last week, and anytime, anytime you ask him about great games he was a part of, that game at Death Valley, the atmosphere, the environment, the victory is always something that he brings up, man. So I was very happy to see that game on there. And, and I, I tend to be a little bit biased to not only, you know, games that, that happen, you know, during my real recollection as a sports fan for me, I was born in 84. So a lot of my real memory started, you know, from the early nineties on, but I also tend to be biased towards games I was in attendance for or games that happened while I was a student at Miami and, you know, the Miami at Clemson game, I wasn't in the building for that, but that, that was a game that I watched while, you know, a member of the student body. So that, that's certainly one that I look back fondly and I thought you hit the nail on the head with that one Vishnu because anytime you talk to a guy who played for the team that year that one is always a game these guys remember yeah and and I think one of the things that's kind of it's tragic especially now that he's passed on but I think we forget how good Tyrone Moss was um yeah he got yeah. injured in that Virginia Tech game that year and never really he was always like borderline on the weight side conditioning side and I think that kind of just pushed him over the edge I mean, Blue, you followed him in high school. He was amazing. Yeah, yeah, he was. That Clemson game was kind of his masterpiece. They could not. So our offense stunk that year pretty much. It was really (laughs) just him. Um, And he leaned on that Clemson defense the whole game and then toppled them over in those overtimes. And it's it's a performance we forget about. He was so good. And I really wanted to kind of honor him almost with that selection because because he's kind of forgotten how legendary he was in high school and college oh yeah you know he wasn't i'm glad that you included the a couple of boston college games because people don't realize that boston college has forever been a thorn in miami side i mean even going back to the hail flutie game but but that 91 game miami was so much better but and, and i do remember that one in particular because um, a, f- a forgotten name, may he rest in soul, Martin Patton, who was a running back for Miami back in the day, came out of Houston. Uh, he was actually their starter, um, and he had been suspended, uh, and he got replaced by Stephen McGuire. And he, we all know Stephen McGuire who turned out, I believe, in the 91 season as being one of the, the, the huge cogs for this program. But that game – Miami had no reason even being close to Boston College. They were so much better in every way. But that was a 1914 game. I still remember. And it kept Miami's unbeaten streak. I don't know if you're – well, back in 91, Miami had a 15-game winning streak going yeah. into that game. And I remember prior to that game, and that was one of the games that you picked, and, and I remember everybody talking about if Miami was primed for an upset, this would be it. Because you had a, a Boston College team that always gave Miami fits. Miami was without, you know, uh, I think um, Barrow was hurt. Michael Barrow was hurt at the time. He did actually uh, play in the game and, and have a, a key pick, uh, if, I, if I recall. But here was a team in Miami that was 9-0 and going against a 4-6 and Boston College team at night in Chestnut Hill. And Miami won the game 1914. But to me, they kept Miami's streak alive. They had the longest streak, I think, at 16 games. And that was a game that if I was going to pick a game, Fish knew, that would have been definitely one of the games because here was a Miami team that, I mean, right in the middle of that, you know, that 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, where they had that five years of just craziness. You know, I mean, they were just so head and shoulders above everybody. But yet here was a Boston College team that had enough in the tank to push back and keep this and keep keep this thing right down to the wire but uh, that was a great game 
Yeah, and so when I actually, by the way, you have like a photographic memory. I don't know. I rewatched it fairly recently, and you're like freaking off things. He he, he hasn't watched it since the day it happened, and yet he remembers it. I'm sitting here like with my jaw dropped as you're like referencing because I watched. No, I was thinking about the game game. recently, and I was like, nailing these plays from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, that. Yeah, that was uh, because I remember that uh, you know Gino Toretta, our friend Gino Toretta. Was was big in that game, and that was his big year. I, it's just that those games that you picked out, and I'm and and I'm like Alex. I I'm glad that you didn't pick up those, you know, Florida State games or the games that you know everybody really recall. But these games that they do recall. But then when you kind of remind them of of this game or any of the others that that you that you did, and I I looked them all over yesterday, and I'm going, wow, uh, these were. I mean, it, these were awesome because even though they weren't, you know, weren't games that if you, we were talking, you know, over a, a couple of cold ones, say, Hey, you know what? Remember that this is something if you said, Hey, do you remember that Boston college game? Hey, you go, Oh yeah. Or that wake forest game when, when Duke did extremely well. Yeah. I like it. I, I think you guys did an awesome job with it. Well, in yeah, Vishnu, how, how one hard of was it? Just, just real quick, closing on that. So Gino Tread actually saw that when I, when I published the 91, uh, <laughs> Boston College game, and he actually said, "Yeah, Tom Coughlin. That was his first year coaching Boston College. His response was they, that Tom Coughlin figured out a bunch of our blocking schemes offensively wow. and put a defense out there. He said it was the best defensive game plan he had ever wow. gone against. Uh, wow. So I think that's probably explains like, yeah, Miami was way better, and it should have been a blowout. Yeah. But the, yeah, the, it should have been. The, but Tom Coughlin obviously went on to win Super Bowls as an amazing coach. Kind yep. of figured some things out and put a game plan that almost." derailed a championship <laughs> exactly yeah and i'm i'm going through even uh the honorable mention games and, and how hard was it to decide against putting some of these on the final draft like one of my fondest memories at the orange bowl and i know blue and i have talked about this game a couple times in recent weeks i think we talked about this one with don solinger a couple weeks ago i, I think uh brian monroe brought it up last week as well the Thursday night game uh, against West Virginia in oh, the Orange Bowl, um, but uh, when, when Kellen Winslow made that, just he he unbelievable like catch feet in the air on fourth down to catch that Brock Berlin pass to to keep yeah. Miami in it. I mean that. And listen, I'm I'm not questioning your final draft. I, I think you did a great job. But like, how hard was it to keep some of these honorable mentions off the list and decide some games over others? I mean, it was splitting hairs like you mentioned that game and and so it's interesting some of the things that make some of the games like one of the things that made that game was West Virginia that run that I think it's Otis Wilson or his yeah kid. Otis Wilson right, I think right, Quincy's right. This, his son right that basically ran over a bunch of future NFL Hall of Famers on a screen pass that was blown up like wow. he runs past Will Fork runs over Vilma like runs over Merriweather past Sean right, Taylor and scores that. a touchdown and that's yeah, I do that remember set off that. that set off the whole sequence. Huh. Um, so that one, yeah, that one was really hard to keep out of the top top ten or twelve because it's just. But I think the opponent makes it that Louisville Thursday game. Um, that one um, that you referenced earlier, I think everyone remembers the Hester return. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, so it, I almost disqualified it for being frankly too memorable. <laughs> <laughs> but what we don't realize, I don't think a lot of people realize. I'm sure we do on this call because we're obsessive about football but um <laughs> but so we had knocked out Louisville starting quarterback their backup who was Brian Brom came in and immediately led them right back down they scored a touchdown Jeez. after that and my we had to go back down and score again after that to win the game like the Hester punt return put Miami in front and then Louisville came back and scored another touchdown Miami had to go score again um <laughs> like that and so that opponent elevates the game sometimes so, so Blue, Blue, one thing I'm curious about from your memory, uh, because I'm, I'm pretty much in, in the same boat with, uh, with Vishnu, that it's, I, I can't really recall a lot of great games that happened before, you know, the national championship era started in 83. Like, are, are there a couple that stick out to you, like games from like pre-1983 that you would say, oh, th- these are some of the best games in Miami football history that a lot of people don't remember or aren't even aware of? Well, the 66 tie with the, uh, with Notre Dame when we were there and it was, I mean, my, again, Miami, Miami in that case had no reason being in the game. You had a Notre Dame team that was just amazing. I think top five nationally. Um, back in those days, Miami would play on those Friday nights. 
Um, they, they back in '73, they 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 got Texas, who was number four in the nation. Miami beat them. Uh, 1967, USC came in here; they were number five in the nation. Miami beat them. Uh, those type of games there back in the '70s and in the late '60s, a lot of people obviously didn't know, but those were games that you know. As a, when I was a kid, I I still remember those games and. And, you know, like uh, legendary names like Chuck Foreman and people like that who did an awesome job. I mean, to me, those type of games, uh, there was a game in 19, against Tulane, I believe, in 1972, where Miami was given a fifth down. And you could see it. And they won the game on the fifth down. Um, it was a pass from Ed Carney to Whit Beckman in the, in, the end, in the corner of the end zone. And the next day, even in the Miami Herald, it has Miami wins on fifth down play. <laughs> and uh, yeah, those type of games like that. Obviously, everybody in the late '80s, '90s recalls a lot of these games. But before Miami was Miami, and and, and Vishnu said, you know, '83 prior to '83, they just, you know, did just been another blip on the map. You know, I mean, small at that um, until Howard got there and then kind of, you know, put the put the program into prominence. Um, those type of games, uh, you know, obviously people don't remember a lot of those games, but if you look back in history, uh, especially the 66 game with, with a Notre Dame team that was just stacked, uh, you know, Terry Hanratty went on to the Pittsburgh Steelers and, you know, and then and the Hurricanes had, did, you know, Ted Hendricks. And, but those type of games there, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, obviously weren't here for, but those type of games like that, I would like to have seen, you know, maybe one of those from, from the past, but uh, you know, there's, there's always, there's always time. You know? <laughs> and I think yeah, the ones that funny you of did, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But with the ones you did, I mean, like I said, I can't argue because, you know, you want to kind of hit the modern day, at least people who are, you know, have some memory or the parents have some memory and they could sit down there, especially in the times that were going on and say, Hey, I remember that game. You know, I was with this, you know, I was with grandpa back then and, yeah, I like that. I I like what you did. I like a lot of the games. Like I said, I do remember even, you know, some of the, the games into the 70s, 60s, and 70s. And seeing the neat thing about it, especially back in those days when they played on a Friday night, is here you would have like a um, um, an Earl Campbell, uh, you know, coming into the Orange Bowl on a Friday night, and there'd be a lousy 23,000 uh, fans at the most. And they complain about the crowds today. You know, yeah. I mean, back then you had nothing. I mean, a, a Florida Gator game on a Friday night where Miami played them, uh, I think it was back in 77. Uh, and uh, I think they had 28,000 people. Uh, you know, those type of games. That, but out of those games, a lot of a lot of the stars of those days emerged. The Reuben Carters, you know, as I mentioned, the Burgess Owens. Miami had guys. You know, it's just not like they do now or like they used to have. But, uh, but, to, but to read about – uh, like you said, Tyrone Moss, a kid that I that used to cover in youth football before, and then he went to Coconut Creek and ended up at Ely, and then he came in with that huge class. If you remember back then, with Siren uh, with Wims and all those guys like that, and uh, uh, the nose tackle and uh, Taraz McRae, and yeah, that's it's it's great to remember because what this does is it gets your memory going, is and I'm sure that's what it was intended to say, you know, oh, oh, yeah, I remember that game. And like Alex said, you know, you we, we talked about the uh, 2002 games and we talked about the, 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 the game, the Boston College game, where, again, it took, took the Ed Reed to, to take the lateral all the way for Miami to win the game, you know. And, and, and again, Miami had so much at stake and, and, and so much talent. But, uh, yeah, well, well, job, well done with this. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed them all. Well, and, and Blue, what you bring up with remembering some of these players, I, I think, to me, that's one of the great uh, sort of side effects of talking about some of these old games and watching some of these old games back are you really start to look back and watch a guy like Tyrone Moss, who sadly is no longer with us, and what right. a talented, talented player he was. You know, you guys brought up Duke Johnson, and I'm glad that Vishnu was able to include a Duke Johnson game on the list because, you know, he – you know, I'm not going to say he gets forgotten because he wasn't here very long ago, but, you know, certainly the teams that he played on, these Al Golden teams were not great. So I'm sure down the road he's going to get lost in the shuffle a little bit. You even start to remember some of the really good opposing players, like the game that Quincy Wilson had in that 
West Virginia game, running over Brandon Merriweather. So, you know, Vishnu, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, you, you, you mentioned guys like Tyrone Moss and Duke Johnson. Or, you know, when you're going through and, and recalling and watching plays from some of these old games, are there any other players that jumped out to you like, man, I forgot how good that guy was or I forgot how fun that guy was to watch? Yeah, there, there definitely are. I think what happened is we were so spoiled around the turn of the century that, like, certain guys like Quatrine Hill is one that, that I saw in so many of these clips that was – playing running back and fullback and, like, yeah. knocking over linebackers. He wasn't even that big. No. Like, and he was just all over the place. And I was like, oh, yeah. i kind of forgotten <laughs> how good he was, and he kind of made the offense work because he could play yeah. multiple positions. And it's just – you just forget. They're, they're, I mean, they're the list – I almost – I didn't name drop one of them. I'm almost hesitant to do so because the list is so long. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I remember – I mean, when – and I'm sure that – that like what Alex said, all of a sudden you're watching a couple of those videos and then somebody will make a play. You know I mean? There's a lot of guys that we take for, for granted, like the rusty Medeiros and people like that, that, that people didn't, you know, Darren Krein and Donnell Bennett, the game that Donnell Bennett had at Penn state that year. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I think he, he I mean, he was, he and Darren Krein pretty much took over the game. People don't remember that until they start watching the game and they go, oh, man, I remember. You know, because a lot of these people, too, know, you know, the Gino Torettas and the Steve Walshes, you know, just from being coaches and being around. You know, they don't remember when they played, but then all of a sudden they get a chance to watch them. And I, I think that's a thrill. You know, I mean, I get that a lot with, uh, you know, the kids like at American Heritage where – you have here's Pat Sertan and a lot of guys didn't even you know these kids weren't around when he played with the Dolphins so you know they'll they'll stick in an old tape and watch their head coach bust a few butts <laughs> and they'll go whoa you know so that's the that's the exciting thing to me is that we're a lot of these kids nowadays have heard, have heard a lot of these kids um and it's funny though I mean if D Duke Johnson I mean he's you know here's a guy he's the all-time leading rusher at the school and with all the great backs, I mean, you're talking Edge and, and you know, Frank Gore and all. I mean, here's a guy who was a leading rusher of all time. So, yeah, I, I think what it does is it brings everybody back. And I think if, if anybody out there listening has an opportunity, please go. Please head to that page and check them all out because you're, you're going to freak yourself out just, just on remembering some of the names, uh, you know, of the past. Amen to that. Well, let's fast forward to the – the present and, and kind of the uh, the murky immediate future. Uh, Vishnu, yeah, I wanted your take on, because Blue and I uh, discussed a little bit last week what Kirk Herbstreet said a week and a half ago that you know he would be shocked if the college football season even takes place uh, this coming fall. And listen to me, uh, I, I, I'm not going to bash a guy for, for sharing his opinion, and it's actually a, a pretty well-informed opinion because especially at that time, uh, you know, the the – pandemic was really looking terrible I, I do take a little encouragement the last couple days on some improving signs in Italy where I have some family uh, living and you know dude China seems to be looking at a light at the end of the tunnel now so hopefully the United States is just a few weeks behind them I'm, I'm being cautiously optimistic on that but you know Viv Vishnu what's your take on you know the reality that uh, maybe the season doesn't happen or doesn't start on time, or we might have to see a lot of games early on played in empty stadiums, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think those are all on the table. I think one of the challenges we have is we're all sitting around with way too much time on our hands. Um, <laughs> and this is, I mean, it's called, it's in the name, right? It's either you hear it referred to as the novel coronavirus, means it's new COVID-19 because it was in 2019 is late in the year. It was kind of, discover it as a new strain of virus. We don't know anything about this thing, realistically. Yeah, um, you're right. That's why the guidance is so vague, stay apart. Like, originally they said, you know, it's fine if you're, if you're not in a vulnerable category, and that turns out, well, not really. You can easily carry it, right? Originally I thought it wasn't tr really easily transmittable between humans. We found out that was wrong. So just constantly learning about it. Um, and so I think because there's, we're trying to fill time, you know, they ask Kirk Hertz Street, what do you think about these? Like, there's no way it's going to be played. Like, he doesn't, no one really knows, right? No, you know, no. Even the scientists don't know. They're using models that are getting new data every day. Right. And they're adjusting right. them every day, which is how it's supposed to work. There's nothing wrong with any of this, but it's all 
so gray to, to, I mean, we're talking months away, right? I do think one of the additional challenges with college is these are not professionals. They're not paid. And if the campus is not safe for students to return, how could you possibly ask the athletes to? Yeah. So I, I think that's a different, because you could sort of, if it was a professional setting, you could literally say, tell a professional athlete, as long as the, the, uh, the labor union agrees with it, say goodbye to your family. You're living at the facility now, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we're going to isolate you in the facility. Everyone's going to get tested to make sure no one has it. And you're just basically not interacting with society. Now, I don't think the labor union would go for that. But these are people. They inter- they, they're part of our society. Someone is going to carry this thing with them. No doubt. No and doubt. So I agree. Until, until we get to a place where we're able to, to have a functioning society, it's hard for sports to function. Right. And I don't and know what that looks like. I don't know if that's more testing, if they you know, make a medical advancement. I have no idea. But I, I, don't, I don't really see how you could possibly play in an empty stadium or do something that – because we've been unable to isolate it. That's what right. killed yeah. the NBA, right? One player got it, and next thing you know, half the NBA had it because they all play each other. That, yeah, exactly. And that's when it all started. Once the NBA players got it, then they started shutting down everything. And, and that was the key. And, and, you know, I just heard the other day where they're trying to work out this thing with baseball and sending everybody to Arizona. No way. There's just, there's just no way that's going to work out. Uh, you, I mean, you, you're going to quarantine professional athletes away from their families for an extended period of time. Uh, this is in the 60s and the 70s. You could do that back then, you know, when, you know, you have your boot camps and football and, and these guys stay away for a month, you know. Uh, but you can't do that now. And, and what are you going to do? Tell the, the reporters have to cover the games that uh, they can't go back to their families either. And the support staff and nah, it just – it's either got to be all in or all out. That's, you know, I mean, we're not Dana White. We can't just all of a sudden <laughs> move island. to an island. Yeah, move, <laughs> move to an island and, and, you know, and I mean, I know everybody, I mean, we, we want that in the worst way. And, and, and no doubt America needs that. I mean, this whole country needs that so bad to watch a live sporting event, you know, no matter if there's fans in the stands or not, but not at the risk of getting people sick or maybe even worse. Well, well said by everyone. And, you know, with, with the rate that this information is changing, uh, who knows how this conversation might change next week when, when we right. have some form of it again. But I, I really want to, again, send a huge thank you to Vishnu Parasuraman for joining us. You can follow Definitely. him on Twitter uh, at VRP2003 is where you find this man on Twitter. And, of course, the great series, The Recollected Dozen, at FiveReasonsSports.com. Vishnu, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, man. And Blue, thank you. For Blue, okay. I'm Dono. We'll talk to you guys next time here on Five Rings Canes on the Five Stay Rings Stay safe. Network. Stay safe. Stay safe.